And welcome to First Baptist Church, Somerville, Tennessee. We are delighted to be with you on this uh, Lord's Day to worship and to celebrate. I hope that you've noticed the announcement slides that we have. Uh, I hope that you'll take advantage of those opportunities uh, to serve and to minister. And we just want to take this opportunity now. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer, ask his blessings as we share together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you because as the psalmist said, this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And although we have to celebrate and worship in a different way, we pray that God, you will bless all of your people as we gather together around this live stream. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will bring peace and comfort and encouragement to all of our church family and to those who are struggling, those who are in need right now. Father, I pray that you will just lift their spirits and give them that calm assurance that, Lord, you're going to be watching over us and you're going to deliver us through this time of crisis we're going through as a nation and as a world. So, Father, we pray now that as we celebrate this Palm Sunday, I pray that we will be encouraged by the glorious truth of the gospel of Christ. Now, guide us and direct us as we go through this service together today, and we pray this in Jesus' name, and amen. Well, this is an unusual time and season in which we come together to worship through the means of technology, and I am so thankful and grateful for that. I want you to know that uh, in abiding with the guidelines that our federal government has put forth, that our governor has uh, also established, also, I talked this week with our county mayor and our county sheriff, and so we want to uh, abide by those guidelines that they've set. And I want to share with you that uh, our county mayor, Skip Taylor, and uh, Sheriff Riles both encouraged me to just pass on to our congregation and those who are listening, please, please stay at home during this time of crisis. That's going to be so very, very important. And as you know, the, the statistics are starting to grow even here in Fayette County. And so we want to be mindful of that and we want to be respectful uh, of that. And so I told the, the county mayor and I also told Sheriff Riles that we are going to do our best to be uh, a part of abiding by those guidelines. And I know it creates a hardship, but I also want to let you know that if there is a need, if you have needs for groceries, for uh, prescription drugs or, or items that you need to have, please call us here at the, at the church office or the number that, is on the, that was on the slide so that you can actually uh, let us know and we can help you in getting those, those needs. And of course, uh, the county mayor and the sheriff said that would be perfectly fine. So we just want to be mindful of that. And please be praying for our leaders because that is so very, very important. I want to share with you a three-minute video that our Tennessee Baptist Convention has put together to just kind of remind us to pray for all of those who are literally on the front lines. We have a lot of medical personnel in our congregation, and they have been busy, and they have been serving and working long and hard hours, and they have been at risk of, the, of folks who have this COVID-19 virus. And so we want to lift them up. And then there's other people that uh, may not be in the medical field, but they're, they're on the front lines too. As I think about those who are checking out people at the grocery store, uh, at the drug stores, we need to be mindful of all those folks. So would you join with me for this three minute prayer tour as we remember and as we pray for the men and women who are serving in this time of crisis.
All right, we're glad you're joining us. If, if you're comfortable at home singing this hymn, we're going to sing a couple of hymns together, beginning with that Calvary. Uh, if, if you're close enough uh, where you can see the screen, the words will be up there. Join with me if we sing all four stanzas of At Calvary. spin in vanity and pride caring not my lord was crucified knowing not it was for me he died on calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to My sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to That was good for you. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Again, we'll sing four stanzas. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of But the blood of Jesus, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. I'm from Venezuela, being from the north of South America. I was like, okay, now I'm thinking to move into the north of the north. And well, my wife and I started to pray about it. We thought Canada it was gonna be a place for us to continue doing ministry. When I first came to Toronto, there were only two Southern Baptist Hispanic churches in whole Ontario. At the east of the city, there was no Hispanic church, not at all. And that's how we decided to start a, a Hispanic church because someone needed to look for these people. They have left behind family, friends. They left behind everything just to come here to work. There's a mushroom farm here that they work the full year. We have been coming to this farm, building relationships, studying the Bible, sharing the gospel ever since day one. And we invited them all here. And when we did, we saw God do amazing things. In our church, we have people all the way from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, Venezuela, Colombia, Bolivia, Chile, Peru. And we are already sending believers to start a new church. I knew this was going to happen eventually, but I never thought it was gonna be this fast. God has called us to do his job and we are not doing this by ourselves. It's because you give that we are here to see people having a relation with God, to see people getting baptized. That's amazing. That's, that's a feeling that I'm not gonna describe it even. It is the best. And that was our Annie Armstrong offering emphasis for this week. I, I trust that everyone who is watching that at home, you, you're still planning on, on making your offering to Annie Armstrong. It, it's a great way of uh, funding the missions that we do all throughout North America. Uh, please pray about what you're going to give and, and make that offering strong toward Annie Armstrong this year. I hope we're going to have a, a, one more song, and then uh, Brother Stan's going to come with our morning message. Yes. 
sharing the message of this week. As you know, today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And for the first time in American history, churches will not be able to gather publicly in honor of Easter. But can I give you just a quick reminder? Just because we will not be here in person next Sunday does not mean we do not celebrate Easter. As a matter of fact, for the Christian community, every Sunday is Easter celebration of recognizing the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as many have stated on Facebook and through social media this, this week, churches may be, church buildings may be empty next Sunday, but we need to remember that the tomb is still empty and has been for over 2,000 years. So we're thankful and we're grateful for the reality and the truth that Jesus is alive. And Jesus is the Messiah. And so what I want to do today as we look at the story of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, I want us to see, see what, what happened in that day and how that speaks to even us today. So I hope you have your Bibles available or maybe your iPad or your phone. And I uh, would ask that you turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, and I want to share a message with you simply entitled, The Arrival of the King. As we think about this day of celebrating Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, I want us to see what took place and how that really responds and how that re relates to even us here today. In Matthew chapter 21, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, the, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's pray. Father, I pray that in these next moments as we read over this very familiar story that we read every year on this Palm Sunday. I pray that we will have a fresh look at what actually took place and how that really helps us even today in the midst of responding to a worldwide crisis. We're thankful that we have a king, and that king is Jesus. And so help us that we might be able to share that message with those who do not know him as personal Lord and Savior. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. On June 30th, 2006, I had the rare privilege of participating and driving in the presidential motorcade when President George W. Bush and First Lady Laura Bush and the Japanese Prime Minister came to Memphis for a visit. The Japanese Prime Minister was a big fan of Elvis and he wanted to come to Graceland. And so part of our uh, trip that day in the motorcade was to go to uh, Graceland and then we stopped by the Lorraine Motel and, and they saw uh, the place where Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And then we stopped at a famous barbecue place in Memphis, the Rendezvous, for lunch. There were several things that really stuck out in my mind about participating in that motorcade. Number one was the preparation that it took. There were weeks and weeks before the president ever landed in Memphis where preparations were being made for his arrival. Also the Japanese prime minister was coming and so his country was also making preparations. 
And that day, we had to get there early, and we picked up the vehicles that we were going to be driving, got to the airport two to three hours before the president ever landed, going through all sorts of details and instructions about what we were supposed to do in the motorcade. It just reminded me about how much preparation it took for the arrival of the president. And then also, when the president's plane arrived, watching all the intricacies of people moving about and getting everything together to move. They said that possibly that motorcade was the longest in presidential history because it had two world leaders. And so not only was there the motorcade of our president, but it was also the motorcade of the Japanese. They had their security detail, their press people, their uh, health officials that were traveling with them. It just amazed me at all of the planning and preparation it took for the president to land. The second thing that stuck out into my mind is we were driving through the streets of Memphis, and I can honestly say I was able to drive 70 miles an hour in Memphis with no fear of getting pulled over. But in that motorcade, it was interesting watching people on the sides of the street. There were people that were laughing and cheering and waving as the motorcade went by. People were excited with the president coming to Memphis. But then there were also some other people on the side of the road that were very angry. They were protesting. They had their signs, and some of them were pretty obscene. But they were there protesting the president and his visit. It just amazed me at how you had two different feel, feelings of the president's arrival. That leads me back to the story that we just read. The Bible tells us that Jesus told his disciples, I need you to go and make preparations for me to come into Jerusalem. Now what's interesting is that Jesus, in coming to Jerusalem, that wasn't just a friendly visit he was making. It wasn't just something they decided. This was planned from the very foundations of the earth. That's why Jesus came. He came to go to Jerusalem and there to become the Passover lamb not just for the people of Israel, but for everyone in the whole world. And as Jesus was preparing to come in, he sent those disciples ahead and said, I need you to find me a donkey and find that colt of that donkey, and I want you to bring them to me so that I can ride in. And Matthew tells us here in our text that all of this was done so that it might be fulfilled what the prophet had spoken. And as I thought about our preparation for that motorcade when the president came to Memphis, so the preparation was made for Jesus to come into Jerusalem. But then as I shared about seeing the two different crowds that were gathered to voice their appreciation or their uh, not appreciation for the president, we find the same thing happens here in the city of Jerusalem. You see the multitudes came out to meet Jesus. And they knew that by Jesus riding on that donkey, several of them understood the prophecy from Zechariah. And, and we find that as he came, that riding on that colt, that this was a sign that he was the Messiah. And so they lined up on the sides of the road, and they were throwing their coats down, and they were cutting palm branches down, and they were throwing those down for Jesus to go over. And they were excited. Listen to what they said. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. There was great celebration on the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. But I want you to notice something you may not have really paid close attention to in our text in verse 10. When he had come into the Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Who is this person? Now, it could be that there was some condescension in this question. Who does this guy think he is coming riding in on a donkey, people sitting there and praising him and shouting Hosanna in the highest? As a matter of fact, one of the gospel accounts actually say that the chief priest and the, and the religious leaders told him, you need to rebuke the people and tell them to stop doing that. But the question was, who is this? Who is this person? Some just didn't know. You see, Jerusalem was abuzz with people from all over as they came to celebrate Passover. So there were many people there that had probably never even heard of Jesus Christ. So what I want to do is share just three areas of concern out of this text of Scripture 
that I believe also address us today in 2020, even in the midst of the crisis that we're going through. Let me share them with you quickly. First of all, people really didn't know who Jesus is. They really didn't know. The people said, who is this? Notice the, that Matthew records, he says, all of the city was moved. So who is this man? Who is this guy who's coming in? And they did not know. Now many were quick to tell them, oh, this is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the one who raised Lazarus from the dead because that word had started getting out. And anytime somebody came back from the dead, that's big news. And so there were those that were hearing that for the first time. You find that even the worshipers, the multitude said in verse 11 of our text, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. That's who he is. He is Jesus. But I want you to notice that even some of the worshipers did not really grasp who Jesus is. Because you see, they were looking for a king. They were so excited because the scripture tells us in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, that he would become, he would come in riding on a donkey. Listen to this verse. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. They recognized that Jesus had to be the Messiah according to the words of the prophet Zechariah. The only problem was they were looking for a king to deliver them from Roman rule. Yes, he was their Messiah, but he didn't fill what their expectations were. You see, the people of Israel wanted a savior. They wanted a deliverer from the state of Roman authority. But Jesus came as a savior and a deliverer from man's sin. That was the difference. So even the worshipers did not quite understand. And we know this because in just less than seven days, these same people who are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, are now going to be crying out on Friday, Crucify him, crucify him. Even to the point that they preferred having a criminal than Jesus Christ. So even the worshipers didn't really know who Jesus is. But then can I share something else with you? Even the disciples weren't really completely sure. In Luke, or in, in John chapter 12 and verse 16, as Jesus is coming in, and it says this, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, when he was crucified and then resurrected, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Isn't that interesting? Even the disciples weren't really completely sure who Jesus is. Today, most people don't know who Jesus is. Did you know there's a lot of people even right here in Fayette County? Some have never even heard the name Jesus Christ. Now we think living in the Bible Belt in the South that everyone knows. But the reality is there are many people who do not even know his name. Not only that, there are some who would say, well, I believe that Jesus lived, but I don't believe he's the son of God. There are even some that believe in God, but they don't believe in Jesus. There are some that would even say, well, I don't believe in Jesus at all. I think that's just a made up fairy tale. You see, even today, there are differences of opinion on who Jesus is. Can I tell you this? Just because you know him mentally does not mean you know him spiritually. You see, the Bible is very clear about that. The Bible even says that, hey, the devils believe and tremble. So you can believe in God, but if you do not believe in Jesus Christ and who he is, then my friend, you could die lost and spend an eternity separated from a holy God. The question 
that we need to ask ourselves is who do we really believe Jesus is? The Bible tells us you must believe that Jesus is and that he is the Son of God and that he is the Savior, the Lamb which taketh away the sins of the world. And Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So that area of concern on that day in Jerusalem, who is this? I would ask you that question today. Who is Jesus to you? The second area of concern had to deal with the temple. If you'll notice, the scripture picks up after where we stopped reading our text, that Jesus went into the temple. Now, according to Mark's passage, the Bible says Jesus went into the temple, he looked around and saw what was going on, and then he left and spent the night and then came back the next day. But what Jesus did when he came back the next day in the temple is very profound. Let me pick up in Matthew chapter 21 in verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Every year at Passover, multitudes of people would come from out of town and they would gather to celebrate Passover. Passover was huge. It was multitudes of people. And several things took place. As they would come to the temple to worship, they had to pay a temple tax. And especially for those that did not live close by and they came a long way away, they had to come. Some of them came with foreign currency, and so they would have to have the money exchanged into the temple coins that would be accepted for their worship. So there was people sitting at the gate. It looked like it was, it was helpful. It was able to exchange their money so that they could pay their temple tax and be obedient in their worship. And then there was also the group that would sell doves. And the scripture says that they were uh, the dove sellers. Now there were many poor people that traveled. Can you imagine being far, far away and having to take that time and spend that money to travel all the way to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover and then to get there, but you need a sacrifice, you need an animal. And so the doves were sometimes used for the poor that did not have lambs or other animal sacrifices. And so there was the exchanging going on and where people could buy those doves so that they could worship as they should. The only problem was is that that turned into something worse than what it was actually intended to be. The Bible tells us that even Jesus was questioned about did he pay temple tax? And Jesus did. And remember what he said about that coin, whose image is on that coin? Render under Caesar that which is Caesar. And so he paid tax and he paid the temple tax. But we find that then as people gathered, it became evident that there were people taking, care, or taking advantage of those who were in need. And there was profiteering. Uh, if we kind of compare it to today, there were people who were gouging in the midst of a crisis. And so Jesus, when he saw this, this really made him upset. And he overturned the tables and he cast them out of the temple. And he made a big declaration there. And he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. And so we find that Jesus said that the temple needed cleansing. I want you to think about that. There were people that were more concerned about sales than sacrifices. They were more concerned about uh, profit more than prayers. And I wonder, could that be said about our churches today? During this time of this coronavirus, Churches are having to experience something we've never had to really experience like this before. People are not able to come to the church building. We're not able to worship in person with one another. And so we're having to rethink and reevaluate how we can do ministry during these days. But this might be a time for us to stop and pause and to think about what does God desire from us? Now I would say this, Though our sanctuary is empty, except for Stephen and Jason and myself, and we've got 
Steve Reeves at the door. That's all that are here today. It seems like, well, there's not a lot going on, but I can tell you one thing. I believe that the people and the members of First Baptist Church Somerville have been praying like they've never been praying before. And so as Jesus came in, he said, my house should be a house of prayer. Can I tell you something? I believe that the house of the church family of First Baptist Church Somerville are praying. But we also need to be reminded of a couple of things. We need to understand and remember that the church is not the building. Yes, in Jesus' day, the temple was the place where people would come. That was the place where God would inhabit for people to worship. But when we come to the New Testament after Jesus came and after he died upon the cross, then something very unique took place. The Bible tells us that now the body is the temple of God. God now resides not in a building called a temple of brick and stone and mortar, but he now lives in the temple, the bodies of believers. And the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and so that now our body is the temple. And so as we think that Jesus came and he saw the temple, let me ask you this question today. What does Jesus see when he looks at your temple? You see, it might be that we may need to be challenged this week to think about what we're doing in our lives with our bodies. Does our temple need cleaning? You see, we all wrestle with sin. We still struggle with that sinful nature. The Apostle Paul put it this way, the things that I don't want to do, I wind up doing, and the things that I I, I want to do, I don't do. And so there's that constant struggle that's taking place in our bodies. And then we, if we're not careful, we can fall to the temptations that are before us of lust, of pride, of arrogancy. You see, we can fall to a lot of different things. It could be that God is asking you and me today, does your temple need cleaning? And so I would just simply ask on this Palm Sunday for the arrival of a king to let him clean your temple. You see, a lot of people want the blessings of salvation. They just don't want to adhere to the obedience of sanctification. See, when God saves us, he cleanses us from our sins and from the penalty of sin. But now we have to live day by day, and we need God to give us the strength that we can live a life that is pure and holy and righteous so that he can be glorified. The third area of concern that I want us to think about is that the people did not understand what the time was. If you will, turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, and here we have Luke's account of Jesus coming in to Jerusalem. And in verse 41, it says this, Now as he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it. I wonder, are we weeping for our cities, our counties, our states, our nation, our world today? When Jesus came into the city, Jerusalem, the city of God, the holy city, it was the most significant place in the life and history of the nation of Israel. And yet when Jesus looked at the city, the Bible says he wept over it. Listen to what he says. If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. And that day would come in the future when Jerusalem was taken. But listen to these last words. He said, that's going to happen because you did not know the time of your visitation then the very next verse is where he comes into the temple and cleanses the temple think about that Jesus weeping over the city as he's entering in Jesus knew what this week was going to hold for him he knew he was going to be arrested he knew he was going to be tried he knew he was going to be beaten he knew he was going to be crucified he knew he was going to be buried and he knew 
he would rise again. Jesus knew that. And as he came to the city, and he saw the people worshiping and celebrating and, and welcoming his entrance, he knew that in just a few short days, they would be the ones crying, crucify him, get rid of him. We'd rather have Barabbas than Jesus. Jesus wept over the city. He wept because he saw what was going on in the temple, how that people had misused and how that they had lost the true focus of what that church was for. Could Jesus be weeping over our world and our nation today? The answer to that question, I believe, is absolutely. And maybe, just maybe, in the midst of this coronavirus crisis, maybe this might be what it takes to help people understand what time it is. Jesus told his disciples and his followers that day, you did not know the time of your visitation. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is in your life? You see, it's time for us to recognize and to realize that this world is not going to last forever. But my friend, you and I will last forever. And we will last forever somewhere as I think about what he was doing in that day I think about what God is doing today people might say where is God in the midst of this crisis well God is where he's always been on the throne people will say why doesn't God do something my friend he is doing something as a matter of fact just as he entered into Jerusalem that was prophesied years and years and years before, I want you to know that Jesus is arriving here in our world today. He's doing it through the lives of his children, his disciples, his followers. And I want you to understand that God is at work right now. We may not see where he's working. We may not understand how he's working but I promise you that he is. If there's one thing that we all need to come to understand is that in the midst of this crisis, we need to trust Jesus and trust him only. I'm thankful for our government and giving directions and leadership in, in how we need to fight this coronavirus. I'm thankful for the scientists and the doctors who have wisdom and understanding. But can I tell you something? The government is not gonna stop this crisis. The doctors and scientists are not going to stop this crisis. Only God can do that. Now, he may use those individuals to bring it about. But my friend, I want you to understand, it is God who is in control. And we need to seek our time with him. The time is now. Jesus said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven I will forgive their sin and I will what heal their land does our land need healing yes it does where is it gonna start it's gonna start with God's people if my people do we really know who he is if we're called by his name, there are some things we need to do. We need to humble ourselves. We need to pray. We need to seek his face. We need to turn from our wicked ways. That's the cleansing of the temple, our bodies. Are we living the kind of lives that are pleasing and honoring to God? Are we living a life of witness and demonstration so that when the world looks at us, they can see not fear and not desperation and not hopelessness but when they see a child of God they can see someone who has faith who has courage who has uh, the, the, the sound mind that hey it, it is bad but we know who's in control he's going to deliver us ladies and gentlemen and especially members of First Baptist Church Somerville family it is absolutely important that we know what time it is it's time for us to shine for him it's time for us to make the arrival of a king now we know that the arrival of the king in that day was Jesus coming into Jerusalem 
in preparation for Passion Week, or Holy Week as some call it, where Jesus was going to be crucified, and he was. He was buried, but he rose again. We'll celebrate that next Sunday. But can I tell you, we need to make ready for the arrival of the King again because Jesus is coming again. My friend, what time is it? It's time to get ready. It's time for us as a church to be faithful in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and a dying world. So I want to challenge you with these things. The Apostle Paul told the Ephesian church, redeem the time for the days are evil. That's where we're living, my friend. We need to redeem the time. And though we're not in a public setting where I can give a public invitation, I do want to give a public invitation that you can respond to right at home. The first thing I want to ask you is simply this. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know? Do you believe that he is God's son? Do you believe that he is the savior of the world? My friend, I want you to know you can believe it in your head but miss it in your heart. And you can die and go out into eternity lost. So I want to encourage you, if you do not know who Jesus Christ is, that today you would accept him as God's son, as the one who came to die in your place, to pay the price for your sins so that you could experience his eternal, joyful life. It's simple. All you have to do is admit, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I believe that you came and that you died upon the cross and that you were buried and rose again the third day. And I accept you as my personal Savior. Will you save me today? The Bible says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I pray, my friend, that you'll do that. And you can do that right at your home, watching your phone or your tablet or your computer. But if you do make that prayer, would you please call us here at First Baptist Church Somerville and let us know so that we can rejoice with you, so we can celebrate with you, and we can help you as you begin a new life in Christ. But then secondly, I want to encourage you, child of God, how's your temple? Does it need cleaning? Maybe there's some things in your life you know are not pleasing to God. You just need to say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for those sinful habits. Forgive me for those sinful things that I'm doing. And Lord, may you cleanse me and use me as your witness. The important thing to understand is the time is now. We have no guarantee of tomorrow. We don't even know what's going to happen. Many people are dying every day from coronavirus. Not everyone will die from coronavirus. But my friend, I can tell you, everyone will die because of sin and its effect. And so I want you to understand the time. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Let's pray together. Father. I thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for this opportunity to look into the experience of you coming into Jerusalem and how the people responded. And Lord, I pray that today there would be people who would respond to who you are. And I pray, Lord, that we as your children, that Lord, we will constantly come before you and allow you to cleanse our temple, our bodies, so that we can be witnesses, we can be good examples of men and women who love the Lord and who are willing to serve you. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone today that does not know you, that I pray right now that they would, in faith, ask you to come into their heart and to save their soul. Father, we pray that you will guide us through these days ahead, through this time of crisis. And Lord, bless the families and bless those who are struggling with the sickness and the caregivers. Lord, strengthen them we pray, Father, for all of those on the front lines, the first responders and all the other essential workers. Father, keep them safe and help them to be able to do their job so that people can have their needs met. But most of all, I pray, God, that you will empower us as your church, as your people, Father, to go forth in this world sharing the best news that's ever been given. And that is, is that Jesus loves us and that Jesus saves. So Father, bless us this week 
as we reflect upon what you did at Calvary. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, just a couple of closing thoughts I want to share with you. Thank you for joining us, and we'll be back again on Wednesday evening with a time of Bible study. We will be trying to post some things throughout the week, some updates and some devotional thoughts. So just uh, check the Facebook and, and our website. And if you need anything, please do not hesitate to call. Our church office will be open. The staff is here, and we will try to minister in whatever way that we can to assist you in your needs. But again, just be mindful and stay at home as best you can, and let's be witnesses of good citizenship in our country, not just for ourselves, but for the sake of our fellow man and neighbors. Now also, uh, I want to share with you that it's been shared around on Facebook a couple of interesting things. And since we can't gather together next week in worship, let's celebrate Easter in a, in a great way. Several people are putting red ribbons around their doorposts and around on their porches. Wouldn't it be great if all of us as members of, of First Baptist Church Somerville, let's, let's do our part. Let's, let's put some red around our door and around our porches. And as people drive by and see, they will know that we are under the blood of Jesus Christ. And we recognize what Easter is all about. It's about the shed blood of Christ paying for our sins, and then he rose from the grave to prove that he did. So I pray that you'll participate in that. And then we'll see you next Sunday morning as we celebrate a risen living Savior. I shared this in closing Wednesday night, and I'll leave this with you this, this morning. We don't go to church. We are the church. God bless you.